Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. When I was but a wee lad in the mid-90s, one of my favorite shows was Gargoyles, a series about mythical creatures that fought evil at night but turned to stone by day, and they were magically cursed until waking up in then modern-day New York. There was stalwart and noble leader Goliath, his mentor Hudson, an aging warrior distinguished by his one eye and use of a sword, loyal and fierce hound Bronx, Lexington, who became the group's techie and the only one with his wings fused to his arms, Broadway, who sometimes fell into the dumb fat guy likes to eat trope, but did grow as the series progressed, and Brooklyn, the de facto leader of the trio of young warriors that struggled to find his place in the world. How were they not used as playable characters in Kingdom Hearts, I ask you? It was very unlike other Disney shows at the time. It had a seriousness, an edge to it. It could be dark, but also had great wit and humor. In the premiere movie, they got away with a little blood and mild swearing. Pay a man enough, and he'll walk barefoot into hell. Or at least a reference to hell, which could be debatable as swearing given the context. It was also controversial for an episode where their human ally, Elisa Maza, is shot, leading it to be banned or certain portions edited for a long time. It quickly gained a devoted following, and the series still holds up today. I just wish it didn't take literal years for them to release the second half of Season 2 on DVD! With a new Gargoyles title currently running, I'm taking issue with the beginning of the Marvel comic based on the show. Let's see if this adaptation makes us want to turn the page, or turn our heads. The cover is good, not too specific about anything story-wise, but very striking. The trio of Brooklyn, Broadway, and Lexington look kind of mischievous, whereas Goliath looks like he's amped to go to the gym and show off his pecs. Also, I don't know why he has hair around his elbows. Maybe Creative Liberty from Joe Maguire and Jimmy Palmiotti. Written by Martin Pasco, with art by Amanda Connor and Alberto Saishan, we begin the issue subtitled, Fiends in High Places. Garth Brooks' less successful follow-up to Friends in Low Places, the clan is introduced to country music, and it does not go well. Narration is provided by Elisa Maza's personal diary. Hey, Detective Second Class, good for her. She describes having to keep secrets from her captain because ever since discovering the gargoyles, she's encountered things she can't put into official reports without being considered insane. I'm telling you, the rat was dragging an entire slice of pizza. I'm not crazy, you're crazy! Case in point, she's undercover at a construction site and confronting an armored perp, who's blasting someone with a strange energy ray. The enemy, whom Maza figures was either intentionally trying to pose as or frame one of the gargoyles, seems surprised by the cop's presence and turns its ray on her instead. She refers to it as a glorified electric cattle prod with delusions of grandeur, but it actually does seem more versatile than that. It broke apart Elise's gun and stole her pupils! Her partner, Matt Bluestone, was supposed to back her up, but he apparently got bonked by some falling tools knocked over from the fight. Elisa hangs from a girder, the enemy going in for the kill. That's when I heard that sound I'm starting to get used to. Hold my hand by Hootie and the Blowfish. Elisa didn't listen to a lot of alt-rock before 1995. No, it's Goliath swooping in, but he's stopped mid-air, bound by the green energy from the foe's weapon. I guess it has a levitation feature, too, since he doesn't drop like the stone he turns into each day. He quickly breaks free, so to divert his attention and escape, the mech blasts the girder Elisa was clutching. She doesn't much like being rescued, but falling from several stories, she's not going to complain. The enemy flies off with the worker he'd targeted on the first page, as Goliath catches Maza. She had left a note warning him to stay out of this particular area, but he interpreted it as a subconscious request to keep an eye on her. I see you've been reading those psychology textbooks again. No, I've actually been watching this program called Frasier. That's also why Hudson has been asking to hire a red-headed physical therapist. Apparently, the detective had arranged for him to live at the Civics Center above the library, which must strictly be for this book, since in the show, the clan awoke on their ancestral castle, relocated atop a skyscraper, then moved to the clock tower above Elisa's precinct. Anyway, she tells him that despite his instinct to protect the city, he doesn't want Manhattanites to think he's going to abduct people. As it is, she actively makes sure weird cases like this don't get pinned on the clan, and would appreciate some cooperation. 
No offense, Elisa, but I feel like he cooperated well enough when he kept you from becoming sidewalk casserole. Goliath feels he could have used an explanation beforehand, which Maza didn't have time to do in person because she had to punch in for the night shift. She explains that a company called RTC wants their new corporate headquarters built in a matter of weeks, so construction is going round the clock. Last night, a riveter returned from his break just in time to see his partner carried off by what appeared to be a gargoyle. The police, like Captain Maria Chavez here, didn't seem to take him very seriously, and the rest of the crew ridiculed him so much any other potential witnesses aren't likely to come forward. Yeah, those construction guys give each other the business over everything. Breaking their leg, impaling themselves on a rivet, seeing robotic monsters fly off with their co-workers. Though they did understand that one of their own up and vanished, so Plenty decided not to show up for work tonight. That made it easy for Elisa to get hired after she asked to investigate. But her captain insisted she take Matt along, despite claims she didn't need help. There were more witnesses to the attack Elisa just interrupted. More workers convinced a gargoyle had come to life, but they all scattered, bringing us to about where the issue began. Kinda clever that her narration here is put in the smoke of one of the guy's cigars. Clever, but not entirely healthy. I hope her narration gets regular checkups and screenings. That's when she remembers. Oh yeah, her partner's still around. After spotting him, they glide over to find Matt regaining consciousness, so Goliath takes off, asking if he and Elisa should meet up again the next night. She insists on handling this alone, so he glides off while she helps Bluestone up, brushing off his talk of seeing something gargoyle-shaped before blacking out, and they go hail a cab to the ER. In the harbor, not far from the site, inside a boat equipped like a villain's secret base, is David Xanatos, the Machiavellian businessman that was at this time an adversary to the clan. He freed them from their stone sleep, but then manipulated them for his own ends, which kind of put a damper on a working relationship. His assistant, Owen Burnett, is explaining that an associate of theirs has brought back another construction worker instead of their primary target. The human abductees have been placed in stasis, and the mech-suited kidnapper is berating a data technician. I can't just make your Instagram go viral! That's not how it works! It's revealed the suit is worn by Demona, Goliath's ex-mate and former member of his clan, turned more villainous because of personal bad experience with humans. She's angry enough that Detective Maza somehow survived a previous attempt on her life in the episode Long Way to Morning, and none too pleased Xanatos' neurophasure device wasn't strong enough to immobilize Goliath. He thinks it was more her failure than anything else, but she warns him to watch his tongue, since she's necessary for Phase 1 of the Medusa Project. Demona and Xanatos are collaborating on an action thriller starring a 90s sitcom star that wants to turn action hero. But the script is terrible, so it'll end up going directly to the discount video bin. An improved version of the Neurophager is in the works, but Demona figures that with Maza alive, she can be used as bait to lead Goliath where they want. We go to Elisa, presumably typing up narration on her computer, about how her partner's been determined to prove gargoyles exist, and this acts as a pretext to her breaking down the history of the Manhattan clan in a few panels. From their time protecting a Scottish castle a thousand years ago, to being cursed, to that curse being broken in the modern day. It's not really inaccurate, just a bit glib. Not unexpected, since they've got their own story to tell here. It also doesn't entirely read like Elisa from the show. Some of the phrasing just feels a bit off, if you ask me, but hey, it does the job. In their clock tower, Goliath has relayed events to Hudson, who not only catches on that this mecha goyle was meant to flush them out, but helps Goliath deduce that Xanatos is most likely behind this, trying to discover their current home. And since the armor sounds so much like Xanatos' steel clan, robots designed after the gargoyles, well, Goliath more or less, Brooklyn and Broadway agree, though not at all distracted from respectively playing video games and scarfing down some snacks. And let me just say, to whomever it was that came up with Zoritos, you should have been given a bonus for that. Despite this consensus, they'll need evidence against the businessman, and that's where Lexington comes in, with a brand new modem for his computer. Nerd! He discovered that the company building the new headquarters, RTC, is short for the Roman 10 Corporation, and actually owned by Xanatos through a series of holding companies. I got suspicious when I realized that Roman 10, or Roman numeral 10, is an X, which is often a logo for Xanatos-owned companies. 
Well, keep in mind, this is printed by Marvel, so there are other possibilities. Professor Xavier lives in New York, so maybe he's starting a new business. Perhaps Weapon X wants to open up an American branch in plain sight. Then again, it could be some pirates hiding their treasure and they want to be all ironic about the old days or something. Hudson figures that having crews work nights was to make it easier to stage the abductions, and Brooklyn is eager to head out the next night and confront the mech, but Goliath shoots the idea down. Remember who the main character is. We're all main characters. Remember who the main main character is. The one with the glorious man voice. He was almost captured, and more of the clan just gives the enemy more targets should they try again. He says he'll be going alone as they all prepare for the day's sleep. The next night, Elisa has managed to get a court order to halt construction. The company itself didn't bother doing so after two abductions, leading her to suspect the boss is behind it all. She's skulking around the premises with Matt Bluestone, who wasn't going to take a week off because of a concussion, just because the doctor told him to, and refusing to head home. The patient and your condition can suffer from a major case of deadness. After all, who needs a partner when she's got a big honkin' six-shooter loaded with hollow points? Well, I certainly trust a cartoon police officer more with that kind of firepower than most real-life people I can think of. And not just because she's incredibly attractive. And she'll need that firepower as Mecha Demona flips over a nearby police car. I think one that still had cops inside, so... So yeah, pretty sure Gargoyle Lady just straight up murdered those guys. Though it's never brought up for the rest of the story. She then targets Elisa, suddenly getting chatty. What would you do in the face of a dragon? Wave a butterfly net! Hey, maybe the dragon also likes catching butterflies. You never know until you ask. Elisa's bullets, which she boasted could perforate Hoover Dam, don't seem to be slowing the armor down, and Matt pushes her aside, taking a hit from the neurophager, which I'm sure will be great for his head injury. Goliath swoops down, only to have a wounded cop thrown at him. How Bluestone lives through this, I don't know. Maza at least manages to break the mech's visor, revealing Demona for all to see, and the detective gets neurophaged for it. I know that's not a word, but hey, neither is neurophage. Seeing his ex laser carry his human friend up the scaffold, Goliath leaves Matt on the ground to be tended by his comrades, then gives chase, following Demona to the boat lab. Inside are several armed goons ordered to shoot to kill when he arrives. Tch, assistant managers, letting a little administrative power go to their heads. Happens every time. The big guy busts in, and their weapons are largely ineffective, Goliath either shielding himself or dodging as he fights back. He takes one's rifle and throws it at Demona, destroying the neurophage weapon. No! Funny story. The script called for me to say yes, but I gave it a little twist. Elisa wakes up and quickly joins the fight, taking out a couple henchmen and freeing the captured construction workers while Goliath starts tearing up equipment. There's an explosion that everyone takes as a good reason to vamoose, with some of the goons taking a dip in the water, and our heroes fleeing to a nearby alley with the abductees. There was no sign of Xanatos, but maybe there will be once the ship's registry is checked, and at least they rescue the workers, so Goliath counts that as a win. Though he's uneasy about Xanatos working with Demona again, as she's generally after the, you know, eradication of humanity. When will she learn? The real genocide of mankind is the friends we made along the way. In his office, David is rather calm about his losses, because the needs of Project Medusa are simple a gargoyle to experiment on, and a human to test the product of those experiments. To that end, he introduces Demona to Dr. Phobos, head of special projects at a facility called Genutech, and who looks at the redhead with a lot of fascination, either because he's never seen a gargoyle before, or he's trying to will that one shoulder strap on her thousand-year-old top to slide even further down her arm. Goliath's crew still wearing old rags, I can understand, being relatively new to modernity. But Demona actually lived through the millennia of time, so you'd think she'd get something a bit more functional. The comic ends with the doc asking if Demona knows anything about laboratory-controlled cellular replication. Because it's not Marvel unless it gets a clone saga! That was the first issue of Gargoyles, and I thought it was pretty good. It felt like an abridged episode of the show, set around its first season, the clan still adjusting to their new surroundings, not just the time, but no longer living in the castle. I liked how Hudson showed his wisdom by guiding his younger leader up at the mysterious Mechagoyle, though it kind of felt like something of a stretch, as if they had to figure it out in that moment for the story to move on. 
though it does raise some questions. Was the armor meant to draw out the gargoyles, or was it because it needed to fit one? Could be both, but it also seems that a properly trained goon could have worn it to the same effect. Though, being more familiar with the clan, Demona does have an edge. There's some tension between Goliath and Elisa when the former is left out of the loop, and that's consistent with the series. He's adjusting a bit differently to living in a metropolitan city compared to the others, and is concerned that the one human he really trusts could have been killed without his intervention. The issue also establishes a secret operation from Xanatos, who you know is overconfident if he's wearing a magenta business suit. Like in the show, he accepts his losses and rolls with the punches, and always finds a new route to meet his goal. Though, had this been an episode of the series, chances are that his plan would have been revealed and neutralized by the end, instead of hinted at and built upon later. They haven't really revealed anything about Project Medusa, but considering the show utilized a lot of different mythologies and various cultures' folklore, there are some things we could probably assume. Medusa was a woman in Greek myth that was turned into a Gorgon, a creature with snakes for hair and can turn people to stone with a look. Stone like what the gargoyles turn into during the day. If the purpose is to experiment on one of them and utilize the results for humans, I'd say it has something to do with David's quest for immortality, something which he sought for much of the show's run. Don't disappoint me. The doctor's name, Phobos, is the Greek god slash personification of fear and panic, so I'm willing to bet there's more to this guy than meets the spectacles. Either that, or he's from the doomed moon of Mars. The art is really good, translating the designs of the show in its own style to great results. Despite editor's caption connecting the comic to the cartoon, fans will notice a few differences, if minor ones. Namely, that Matt Bluestone is suddenly blonde instead of having more reddish hair, and Maria Chavez has much darker pigments overall. It's not a big deal, but it does make me wonder how much of the show the people on the book were told about, or if they just took some liberties. Maybe it's like Rick and Morty, and this is an alternate universe identical to the show, but with only minor differences. Eek, Barbadurko. Somebody's gonna get laid in college. And hey, if you hadn't seen the show, they have a handy-dandy guide after the story to get you up to speed. The issue is solid and self-contained while teasing Xanatos' greater plans. It's a good start to an adaptation of a great show, and both are definitely worth checking out. Next week, we stay in the world of the Winged Warriors by Night, but after the series concluded. Well, depending on which fan you ask. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues. Mm -hmm.